Hi, everyone, and welcome. It is Wednesday, October 27th, and we are having the 75th in a row Knowledge Bowl Light Hangout sponsored by Topher Spin Meteorites. We're very, very happy you joined us today. The topic for today's hangout is going to be Lodronites, a very, very rare meteorite that I didn't have any of, so I actually bought one. Uh, so I have one for show and tell and just for one for my collection. So we're going to have uh, Mike Kelly give our presentation on Lodronites, kind of a deep dive Meteorites 201 on Lodronites. And we're going to have some show and tell related to Lodronites. But I also want to just take a second and introduce the crew to people on, on YouTube. Um, the, the Knowledge Bolide crew really spans all spectrum. We have um, like people like Daniel Shake, who is a uh, professional meteorite classifier. We have um, experienced collectors, um, experienced scientists. Uh, we have just hobbyist collectors, and we also have newbie collectors. So we really have a wide breadth of people uh, in the group with, with varied interests. And that shows when you ask a question and you get different answers. So we have a viewer question we're going to get to later on about, um, about the value of meteorites and the alteration of meteorites. And then I'm going to give my counter answer to Pat. <laughs> so that being said, uh, we have uh, our first show and tell, and that is with um, Mr. Ben Fistler. All right, so these are uh, a couple of Winonites. Uh, they're both of them are uh, NWA 14177 uh, via Dustin Dickens and uh, Mustafa Wulkuch. And uh, this one, the uh, little one, is high metal. And this one is low metal, high silica. Hmm. That's okay. what makes them interesting. So I take that, this little Neo, and it barely attracts this bigger piece. It's almost twice as large. If I can do this, one. it just barely hangs on. This other guy, it just, it just won't wow. go. Wow, big difference. Uh, in fact, uh, if I had a spare hand here, the large one, which is 18 some grams, won't even, some corners it won't even at uh, attach to. It's, I mean, just barely, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really loose. But uh, when I have a chance, both low metal and high metal i just had to yeah that's uh, very interesting that, i may that's have to even though they're this is the high metal right here do you know the weight of that one if the other one is 18 grams that's, yeah it's nine nine point zero eight grams mm -hmm. and this this one's double that it's uh 18 mm -hmm. point zero five I wonder if that was found anywhere near the Irichidia 004 Winonite, or if it's just another sample of that that got classified. I'd, I'd like to look at the uh, at the um, the Met Bull um, chemistry information and, and a write up on that because that looks really familiar. Uh, you know, the, the, the same source on the ground um, for Winon, uh, for the Winoni Irichidia 004, and that also had the low metal and high metal components to it that Daniel Shea classified and did the write-up on. Uh, actually did a report from the, um, from the lab uh, on the Hangout one week. So that's pretty interesting. That's, thank you very much. That's a, an achondrite Winoni, some primitive stuff too. Yeah. Yeah, it was really unusual, to, and the chance to get both, there wasn't much material, so I snapped on it. I, I, and the shame of it was, uh, I unboxed it at last week's hangout, after the official hangout ended, my wife comes in with the box and goes, oh, this came for you. <laughs> <laughs> for, for those that, that are on YouTube that may not know, 
we try to have a fast pace to the hangout. I try to keep going one thing to another because people on YouTube have a 30 second attention span. <laughs> but after the hangout, when, when the moderating is done and, and the, the recording is done, we have a free for all, uh, two hours pretty much. And, and we just hang out and show things off. And yeah, and, and that's when a lot of the, uh, when the jokes not fit for YouTube are made and, and, and friendships are, are strengthened. So uh, we invite you all to, to um, go to um, Topher Spin Meteorites on Facebook, go to the events, and that's how you join one of these, event, uh, one of these live hangouts. We, we also entertain questions from serious viewers. And one question we do not entertain is I have a rock. How can you look at it? <laughs> read, the, read the description because every video tells you how to submit pictures. But we had a serious viewer question about um, meteorites as far as what is the perfect meteorite? Um, when is, uh, what is a, the most unaltered meteorite classification you can get? Um, and the, that was a question that was, uh, that was submitted by a viewer and I tapped Pat on the shoulder to kind of give us his side of, uh, of things on that. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the, the question was, you know, how, what, what's the most primitive, um, and there's a couple of three ways we can answer that. So, um, there's primitive in terms of... And Pat, let's take one step back. Can you please sure. give a definition of primitive? Yeah, absolutely. So primitive is, is one of those words that's probably a little little odd in that it, it may mean different things to different people. But I'm going to look at primitive from two different angles. One from uh, the, the material being as original as possible uh, for the planet building material. And then the other one is the material being as... Uh, unaltered from an elemental uh, standpoint and to have all of the cool ingredients for life sort of stuff. So in, in the meteorological bulletin, there are, we're just shy of 67,000 named meteorites. So these are meteorites that have been through the vetting process by the nomenclature committee and are determined to definitely be meteorites and have been named. And of those, the, the vast majority are uh, higher uh, degrees of metamorphism. There are very, very few clear at the bottom end. So of all of the uh, 3.00 uh, meteorites, there are 10 names. Of those, four are LL 3.00s and one is an L 3.00. So our petrological scale starts at 3.00. That's perfect. And then as you go higher in number to four to five to six to seven, you're getting more and more uh, accumulated time under heat and pressure and elevated temperatures as well. And you'll see the, the, the pretty structure of those, uh, you know, of all the chondrules, you'll see that uh, altered to where by the time you get to a petrological grade seven, you can't see any chondrules at all. Mm -hmm. Rock doesn't really melt. It's solid state recrystallization where the, the molecules move around and, and uh, join new crystals uh, as opposed to where they originally sat. So, so here's, that, that's one example of an LL 3.00. And that one is NWA 12692. And then this guy is another one of those four LL 3.00s. This is NWA 8576. And Topher I'll send notes on these two. Thank you. So in terms of most primitive being least modified planet building material, boom, that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, and However... But so there, there's another way, there's probably 10 ways to answer that question, but there's another way to answer that question that I think is really very interesting. And that is what, um, what material has this, you know, same uh, elemental abundance as the sun. And it turns out that there's a really good candidate. So in the ungrouped C 3.00 meteorites, C meaning carbonaceous. 
seed needing carbonaceous. These are C3.00 ungrouped. And there are a total of four of these, four out of 67,000. Uh, but this meteorite is interesting and can be described as primitive because it has the same elemental abundance as the sun. So it's not depleted in the more um, volatile elements, uh, things like carbon. Uh, these meteorites uh, contain water. They contain uh, a number of hydrocarbons and they contain amino acids. Uh, and so this is really about the building blocks of life. The water that these contain matches the uh, hydrogen deuterium um, ratio of our ocean. And it's very interesting that comets don't match that hydrogen deuterium ratio. Yeah, scientifically, there's different types of water. Mm -hmm. So, so this is a, this is a primitive meteorite from that perspective. And when you're looking at, don't want to jump on your toes there, but <clears throat> when you're looking at the chondrites, the, the, the four or the, the 3.00 to seven, that's heat and pressure um, alteration. When you're looking at carbonaceous and you start at a perfect three and you go down to two and one, that is, uh, um, aqueous or aqueous uh, water change uh, rather than heat and pressure. Exactly. Yes. Thank you for thank you for uh, keeping me on track. There's a lot of things to talk about. And aqueous alteration is very interesting uh, and very uh, uh, exotic in that we're not talking about alteration by um, frozen water. We're talking about alteration by liquid water. So this. This meteorite simply shows a, uh, a bleached chondral. And I'm not able to find it immediately. So, uh, But alteration with liquid water exactly is how we get from 3.00 down to 2 and down to 1. The, uh, the meteorites that are the most uh, uh, primitive from a chemical uh, standpoint have those prebiotic ingredients of life. Uh, eventually kind of look like a charcoal lump as they get to, to petrological grade two and to, and to grade one. Uh, and a great example of that is, is Winchcomb. Yes. Uh, wow. Yeah. The Winch, the Wilcock family actually thought one of their neighbors dumped their briquettes from the barbecue out in their driveway. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to interrupt you for a second. <laughs> Thank you very no much, Pat. No, I, I totally appreciate that's exactly the, the question uh, that the viewer had and the exact answer that I think it needed and deserved. Um, then he continued on, There was, or maybe it was a different, uh, a different viewer, wanted to know about what's the most valuable meteorite as far as classification, you know, about primitiveness. And um, Pat offered me uh, an, uh, an answer uh, earlier from his point of view, which is a, obviously a very scientific point of view. Um, so I'm going to let him give you his 30 second answer, and then I'm going to give you my 30 second collector rebuttal. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know, from a, from a science centric sort of perspective, um, the the more primitive material, the more unmetamorphosed material is more scientifically interesting. And of course, these carbonaceous chondrate uh, meteorites are also very scientifically interesting. Um, but you can also make an argument that uh, just from a supply and demand sort of angle that they are uh, more valuable in that, you know, out of 66,997 named meteorites, the 3.00s, all of them, um, the carbonaceous and the and the ordinary chondrite ones are there's ten out of sixty seven thousand so that's 0.015 percent. Mm -hmm. The three point oh five is slightly more modified is all of 0.018 percent, uh, and then you compare that to the uh, uh, H six uh, for example is nine point five percent of all meteorites. H5 is 16% of all meteorites. 
Uh, L5 is another 16% of all meteorites, and L6 is a whopping 22% of all meteorites. Wow. So L6 is almost well, 22% of all known meteorites. 22%, yes. And in fact, if you add all the L ordinary chondrites together, they're about 45% of all named meteorites. Yeah. Wow. If you That's add a all lot. the H's together, they're 38%. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so due, due to the scarcity and the importance to science, as Pat said, the, well, I'll summarize, the, the closer you get to that perfect unalteredness, whether it's a 3.0 carbonaceous or a 3.0 LL chondrite, that's the perfect and that's the most valuable and the most pretty to scientists and to science lovers. However, <laughs> If you take the exact same material, not to argue, but to add on, if you take the exact same material, like Pat said, wenchcomb, that's a CM2, I think. It's the exact same stuff as, exact same uh, as like Murchison, uh, same classification. But Murchison is six to $800 a gram. Wenchcomb is about six to $8,000 a gram. So it's the exact same scientific stuff. So f- from a point of view of, is a, can a classification be a, the tipping point of the value? To a point, there's so many other factors that go into meteorite valuation. I actually made a presentation and a video on my YouTube channel called the five S's of meteorite valuation. They talk about surface features, story, science, and I'm going to leave the rest as a mystery. Hopefully you'll go out and watch it. But there's lots of other things that, that um, attach value to the meteorite, especially from a collector's point of view. They yeah, only- so, so there's, you know, it's, it's about science, but it's, but it's also about the human history of, of meteorites as well. So, and, and meteorites are, are so diverse that there's a lot of interesting angles you can approach it from, so. Yeah. I'll take my lab coat off now. Thank you, Tim. Awesome. Thanks, Lyle. I appreciate that. And yeah, because there's, you know, if, if you look at if you look at a, a piece of Mars, I, I've sold Mars for sixty bucks a gram, but I also have a piece back there that I'm selling for over three hundred dollars a gram. It's the same chemical material, but one is absolutely super fresh, drippy, glossy fusion crust, and the other one has been wind blown, and all you have is the center of the stone now. So there's lots of variables that go into the price of a meteorite or the value of a meteorite, just like there's so many variables that go into what's a car worth? What's, well, what is a 83 pickup worth? Well, you, you need so many bits of information to really, and then there's other times that you just look at a meteorite and you say, I have to have it. Cost is no issue, throw money to the wind. I'm gonna own that piece. <laughs> um, we have Phil Sisto with his hand up. We'll see if he's ready. So I got a couple of slices in from uh, Craig Zleman, who, as uh, far as I can tell, I mean, I'm still fairly new to this, but he does some of the best um, lab work that, that I've seen in any of the pieces I've acquired so far. Um, so this guy right here is a... Uh, 14 and a half gram of the uh, 13951 NWA uh, lunar. They call it the Starry Night Lunar. Oh, I was going to ask if that was the Starry, starry yeah, Night. It's got this beautiful blue. And then if you turn it just the right way, you can see just flecks of iron all through it that totally look like stars in the sky, even the unpolished side. So, oh, um, yeah. Really proud of that one. But the That's coolest. That's beautiful. One, yeah, the coolest one is uh, this guy right here. What the oh. heck? Oh, wow. Oh, that's like an, an illustration of the universe or something. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So this is NWA, NWA 13987. It's a, a CK4 carbonaceous. Wow. And that is a gigantic calcium aluminum rich inclusion right there in the middle of it. Beautiful. Oh. You could not have placed that better on that slice. (laughs) Right? Um, I saw that, and it was shockingly not as expensive as you would think it would be. I I was like, I have to have that, because CAIs are just fascinating. 
Um, I've been reading on them a little bit before I even got this, but you know, this is like evidence of you know the first condensation of material in the protoplanetary disk, like pre-solar, pre-solar system. And a CAI of this size, you would think there was probably you know, condensation and, and solidifying, and then maybe even some remelting to make all these layers. Um, it's just, just a ridiculous slice. I'm so happy that I had the opportunity to grab it. Yeah, can, CNIs can... are extremely important from a scientific standpoint too. And then like you mentioned, they are a milepost in time that's quite well defined. And a lot of events early in the solar system mm -hmm are X amount after CAIs. Exactly. Yeah, that's the measuring point, the, the, the touchstone. And um, Phil, can we see the other side of that slice, please? Sure. Does the CAI go, oh, my, it does. Jake, you j just a little bit. Yeah. I think, I think Craig may have kept the, uh, like the most mint piece for himself because, I mean, mm -hmm. you don't see something like that every day or ever. Yeah. Um, that is gorgeous. So I man. think I got the edge of it, but yeah, I I was super stoked to grab this piece. So you said that was a CK four. Yes. Okay. So that's carbonaceous, mm -hmm. Karunda type four. Now that's weird, Pat. Explain that to me, because it is a carbonaceous meteorite, but it's a four. I thought the carbonaceous went from three to two and one. It can. It's just about what kind of alteration you're talking about. If oh. we're talking about heat and pressure, then yes, carbonaceous can go three, four, five, et cetera. Um, many of us have uh, samples of a CK5 uh, from Dustin Dickens, um, a wonderful meteorite that he found that is scientifically really important and kind of looks like a charcoal briquette. Yeah, and it has little round black balls sticking all over. It's it's a very unique meter. One two nine two five, I think. Yeah, I've got some CK five. Okay, you guys can quiz me on that later. But all right, guys, we're checking in with Mike. Mike, how are you, buddy? Doing great. How you guys doing? Good. Uh, so uh, I wanted to show off one thing today. Uh, that's non night and. Uh, Last week, we talked about the Diogenites, and I had mentioned that uh, Gustav Rose wanted to make uh, the Schalkites, and that would be Schalko being the first one of its type. And then uh, Gustav Tischermack came along, and we'll talk about him a little more later, uh, and said, no, th that's not right. We're going to call those the Diogenites. Uh, and he took uh, three very early ones, uh, including Schalka, and put them all together. So that being said, I had to uh, go ahead and try to hunt that down. And it ain't much to look at, but there she is. So that is Shulka. So that was like uh, 1857 or something like that. Wow. Um, so there's one Diogenite that's older than this. Uh, it's 50 grams. It's from India. You are oh. not getting that one. No. So this, <laughs> this is the basically the oldest Diogenite you can pick up. Very nice. Uh, What's that dated to? Uh, I think it's it's around like eighteen uh, fifty seven or something like that. Yeah. Wow. I I looked look for a piece of that. I looked for a piece of that a while ago and came up short on it. So congrats. Yeah, it's uh, there's not much of that going around. So. I just got a micro of it. Nice. Um, that's pretty awesome. Thank you, man. Is there something else, or should I? No, no, not till the uh, the lodger nights. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. All right, guys, it's now the time on the show when we have some uh, viewer content. And this one is from our good friend, Maxime in Belgium. And he's just giving us a little teaser of um, what's coming up. Uh, for those that don't know, he, whoops, he has made uh, the, his YouTube channel is the Asteroid Miner, and he made two YouTube videos, uh, and he allowed me to post them on my channel, and they are two of the most popular videos on my channel, which is quite annoying because I work super hard, and his are number one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he has released the trail. He's so good now. He's releasing trailers to upcoming videos. So this is going to be the third installment in 50 Shades of Space Rocks.
and I turned the uh, volume down for copyright reasons or else you'd hear some pretty upbeat music right now. Yeah. yeah his, his videos are extremely popular on my YouTube channel and it's, I, I'm absolutely thankful I get to use them, but it's, it's just annoying as hell. <laughs> <laughs> How many hours I've sent, uh, spent here editing stuff and then number one and number two. <laughs> Some beautiful camera work. Yes, a very beautiful camera. Right work. at episode number three, dropping soon. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Yep. Well, we are uh, taking a step for science now. Uh, in the continued uh, class and outreach that we have for Meteorite 101, we're delving into the um, this organization chart. And I actually have a new one that I need to add that has the CLs on here, the brand new classification. But we are going to be talking about Lodronites tonight. And uh, Mike be, might, might be saying Lodronites or Lodronites, but there's the same thing. So we're looking at... Um, the stony meteorites, and we're only talking about the achondrites, not the chondrites. And within the achondrites, we are talking about the lodronites right here. And you'll see that they are closely linked and connected with acapocolites. So I'm hoping that uh, Mike is able to explain that a little better for us. Mike, I hand it over to you, buddy. Sure, yeah. Uh, thanks, Topher. Um, yeah, so the, the kind of the interesting thing with this is depending on whose chart you look at, um, they're grouped kind of differently. So yeah, they're achondrites, but they actually fall into a little group called primitive achondrites. So sliding over to the right and looking at the, uh, the up arrow there, that's where the lodronites are. And again, they're primitive achondrites and they fall into that acapocoite lodronite clan. Uh, so that's that white box sitting right above them. And we're specifically going to talk about the lodronites tonight. Um, so if you pop down to slide number two, Topher. Yep. We're going to. I inserted this one just so people can actually see what we're talking about when we talk about a lodronite. Okay, this is gotcha. what one looks like on the outside. Just give everyone a little visual. That That's is a, a beauty. A lot of <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chunk of change. So that is a lodronite. That is the main mass. Thank you very much, Shung, for allowing us to use that. This is the interior of it. And then I have some close-ups of the exterior, focusing on a certain feature. And just so we can understand what they look like when they're sliced up, Kevin DeBow, a crew member, um, submitted this video for us. And Phil Schmidt is the main mass holder. I figured before we jumped into all the science, we'd allow people to at least see how beautiful and rare these things actually are. Wow. So Mike is going to be explaining to us exactly what we're looking at and why it's so freaking special. <laughs> or my name isn't Nathan Arizona. All right, Mike, I'm kicking it over to your presentation, buddy, if you're ready. Yeah, sure. All right, thank you so much. Yep. So, yeah, this is the definition, and this is, uh, this is taken right out of the Met Bowl. Um, so, again, they, they fall into what's known as the primitive achondrites. Uh, and, again, the, the, the basic top-level definition is, doesn't really tell you much. You know, it belongs to the acapocoite and lodronite family. Um, so primitive achondrites are achondrites. So like Topher, um, like Topher and Pat were saying, you know, the chondrites go all the way up to seven and then past seven, you start no longer being a hundred percent the same material, um, composition wise, because you started to melt to the point where differentiation occurs. So primitive achondrites are going through a small amount of differentiation. So these fall into that group of, of, uh, a partial melt and there's, Almost the same composition as a chondrite still, but a little bit of the material has started to settle out, uh, you know, towards what would be the core of, of a differentiated uh, parent body. Um, so 
then to break it down even further, you got the Acapulcoites and, and Lodronite family. Um, and these two uh, types of meteorites are closely related. Um, they have enough of a compositional overlay and oxygen isotopic overlay that they could tell that they're from the same parent body. Um, and the, the major difference is the Acapulcoites um, can have what's called relic chondrules. Um, so they still have some material, they still have some of the minerals in the shape of the chondrules that mm. they uh, started out as and then got metamorphosed to the point where the material is no longer the same. Uh, the Acapulcoites are also slightly finer grained uh, than the Lodronites. Um, so those are kind of the two major differences. Lodronites, no chondrules left over, no relic chondrules. Uh, and the green size on the Lodronites are going to be larger. Uh, yes. And the Acapulcoites are the exact opposite. Um, That's awesome. And, that, that, those are two easy facts to remember. Yep. And, uh, and we could definitely tell that they are related to each other because there are actually meteorites uh, that bridge the gap and are transitional between them. So mm. they have breccias containing both Acapulcoite material and Lodronite material uh, in the same meteorite. So again, that's that's a sure sign that we got, uh, we're, we're coming off of the same uh, parent body and it's not really xenolithic. Very um, cool. Next slide. Um, so uh, the Lodronites are, are named after uh, Lodron. Um, and that fell at about two o'clock in the afternoon in Lodron, Pakistan, uh, a very long time ago, 1868. Uh, wow. And it was not an overly large meteorite. It was around one kilogram um, total mass. And uh, the first person who described it was that gentleman I mentioned before, uh, Gustav Tischermack. Uh, and he used it in 1870 uh, to kind of take the classification scheme that Gustav Rose had come up with uh, and make a more accurate classification chart. So you saw that great one that Topher posted up there and the slightly older one that I posted on there. Uh, so you can see over time, science is, has refined how we classify all the meteorites. Uh, and this was one of the early ones that was important towards uh, shifting the classifications. Um, and again- It's cool uh, that he, I didn't mean to interrupt you. It's cool that he even noted that it, is, it has never been found in a meteorite before, only similar, similar to terrestrial olivine. Like, that, it blows my mind that they were so accurate, that he was so accurate back then. Yep, well, he looked he at it and he said it was one of a kind. It. And back then, we didn't need five to get a group. You know, he, he <laughs> kicked it off and said, that's it all by itself. <laughs> and, uh, and his classification scheme was widely accepted across uh, uh, Germany and Europe. So that's why it became popular and kind of still at the core of what we have today besides Gustav Rose. Um, that classification scheme was then uh, taken and modified a little more by uh, George Thurland Pryor. Uh, and he was actually the one who added Lodron, I'm sorry, to the classification scheme. So Gustav Tischermack, first to observe it. Uh, George Pryor, first to throw it in a classification and, and coin the term Lodronites. Hmm. Um, and then down at the bottom, this is kind of a, a sad story. Uh, it kind of goes along with my, my uh, offline sad story about uh, uh, Rashina last week. So the... Uh, Museum in Calcutta sent over the museum in Vienna 700 grams, and apparently it's never arrived. Oh my God. So you're talking about a one kilogram total known weight <laughs> and 700 grams of it, according to, uh, oh. to internet. And again, I, I, you know, I'd love to find a, to backtrack that and find the source and, and validate it. 700 grams is apparently gone. Wow, that's crazy. Could be sitting in their warehouse, like you know, that no, the label fell off and nobody knows. I hear that about museums all the time. I hear, I hear that about museums all the time. It's like they have stuff there and that nobody's looked at for decades and it's just kind of lost. Wow. Yeah, crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, next slide, Dover. Uh, so this kind of validates that a little bit. This is these are minutes from uh, the, the trustees of uh the uh, Calcutta Museum, uh, and this is just a little snippet out of there talking down towards the bottom where uh, Dr. Oldham at the Museum of Vienna says, sorry guys, that specimen you sent us of, uh, of Lodron never oh. arrived. God, that's painful. 
So I, I am assuming that it doesn't reference by mass or anything, but I am assuming that that is the validating proof uh, uh -huh. that that is probably the piece they were talking about. Yeah. And look at the date two years after the fall too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, so that's my first day met. Oh, nice. Oz. <laughs> I'll never get it. You'll never get it. <laughs> Go to the museums and start digging back. There. Start looking through the drawers. Huh? So again, that uh, that definition back from the Met Bowl doesn't tell you much about about what, what's in it besides the fact that it's related to an Acapulco weight. Uh, so here's the rough breakdown of, of what's in there. The majority of the minerals inside of that meteorite uh, uh, class are uh, low calcium pyroxene and olivine. Uh, so you go back to uh, you know Tishermac saying, "Oh, I'm going to compare it to an, an earth olivine," and that's that's why right there. Um, down at the minor phase, right? So that's that's a lot less uh, of the constituent of the material. You got plagioclase and troilite in there, so that'll you'll see your uh, your iron sulfide in there, uh, and then accessories. So very small amounts. You'll get other types of sulfides, a little chromite, some phosphides, and some chromium diopside, uh, which I know you wanted to to take a peek at that, Topher. Yeah, because it's uh, I appreciate you leading because when I got my piece, I saw this on it right away. And I was like, oh, my God, I, I don't want to play scientist here, but I'm going to roll my dice and say that's chromium diopside because it looks identical to uh, erg check diagenite. And here is a slice, the same. Oh, no, this is a different slice. This is um, NWA 13507. Thanks for, uh, for this video as well, um, Dr. Yang. Uh, you'll see that it is uh, translucent when sliced thinly prepped correctly and backlit. Just like erg check. Now that may not be chromium diopside up there. I'm not sure, but the, I know. The upper one, the lower one is the chromium diopside. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah the so. upper is probably olivine. Awesome. Yeah, the interesting, like chromium diopside. Um, so, um, Right. Uh, diopside is a naturally light green mineral. So that top could either be just plain old diopside with no um, chrome content in it. Uh, but mm -hmm. definitely yeah, that darker green and that bottom uh, green are, are pretty distinct and look like uh, like chrome containing diopside. And diopside is just a, a form of pyroxene. Um, so we hear pyroxene being in uh, in meteorites a lot. It's, it's one of the main constituents in uh, lodronites. Uh, and basically all it is, is it's a magnesium and calcium rich uh, silicate mineral. Awesome, thank you, man. Yeah. Um, so looking at uh, uh, some of the things that we talked about, again, it, they are nearly chondritic in composition. So, you know, imagine a chondritic uh, layer of material and it starts to self heat and also get heat from impacts. Uh, and uh, it's also, it's, it's large size as a parent body starts to uh, cause that material to melt. Uh, and again, the heavier and denser material and, and the things that melt out first are gonna start to settle a little bit. Uh, so what you end up with is you end up kind of with a layer that would be the Acapulcoites on the, more towards the surface of that parent body and the Lodronites being uh, some of the deeper material hmm. from that parent body. Would uh, that so that's also kind of be- the relationship. Mike, would that also be one reason why there wouldn't be um, chondrules in the lodronites, but possibly in acapulcolites? Yeah, so they were probably closer to the source where the material was transitioning up towards uh, towards the surface of the parent body. So yeah, that's you know basically okay. a, a very good reason. And those transitionals would be right at that boundary where you're you're moving down and deeper, oh, uh, and they nice. represent uh, like kind of mid level material. Um, so. Uh, Again, uh, the mineralogy and the uh, oxygen isotope ratios uh, and the fact that we have those transitionals all point to this being from one parent body, which is why they uh, get grouped together. Um, and there are a couple of parent bodies out there. I threw two of them on there, two palace and 21 Latidii. I'm probably butchering that. I'm not great with those terms. <laughs> uh, and uh, those were based on a, a 28 study by Newman uh, and a couple other scientists. And they use spectral analysis to kind of look at, uh, you know, the, the bodies out there and what light spectra come off of them. And then the light spectra return from the from those meteorites and see if they can get uh, a correlation. 
uh, to give them an idea. Again, it's not not super exact, but it gives you an idea of where they might be from. Um, and then uh, Pat was talking about a little beforehand uh, about how uh, you know rocks not necessarily always melt as minerals start to change in them. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the the big dork word for the day is. Uh, uh, metasomasticism and that is at the bottom and again that's that exact process uh that pat was talking about uh so when the rock is solid uh there's exchange of uh, chemical exchange within it uh in the presence of, of solutions fluids uh and some of the minerals inside there can change from one type of mineral to another without the rock actually melting it's a substitution process uh and that occurs a lot in the acapocoites and lodronites so that's kind of interesting to, to think that, uh, you know, part of that change we're talking about where they go from being a chondrite to being an achondrite doesn't necessarily mean it's 100% just melting. Some of that change occurs while it's a solid uh, mm -hmm. and, and the mineralogy is just shifting around as ions move through the, the mass of material. Looking at uh, slide seven, Topher. So this is kind of neat, you know, the, the Lodronites have been around since, you know, like what, 1870. So there's been a lot of theories on uh, where they come from, all the way proposed from H chondrites, uh, arc chondrites, different types of carbonaceous chondrites. Um, and most recently, the Kakangari type chondrites have been proposed. Uh, and this was from uh, that paper that I uh, gave credit to down at the bottom left. Uh, and uh, Lique and Kai in 2021 uh, kind of looked at several different characteristics, what the mineralogy is, um, o uh, o isogen isotopic ratios, and a bunch of other things. And, and then they kind of used that as a weed out to say, hey, you know, what's the most likely parent body uh, or parent material to, to this parent body? Um, and what they came up with was the Kakangari type K chondrites were probably the best fit. So now, that's not a CK. That's not a CK. I'm sorry, Mike. I don't mean to talk over you. That's that's not a CK, is it? That's no, just a no, K that's chondrite. that's the K chondrites. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And and can you name? Can you say the name one more time, please? Uh, Kakangari. Thank you. Uh, and then next slide. This is this is the last thing I had in there. This just kind of gives you an idea because uh, we we're also talking rarity. Um, so in the MEP poll out of that uh, 67,000 that, uh, that Pat kind of mentioned, you got 87 Lodronites. That's it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and, you know, some of those are pairs, some of those are Antarctic, like Pat was saying. So, you know, if they find two pieces next to each other, there's two individuals in the numbers. So, yeah, 80, 87 total. There are 11 transitionals. Those are those odd, odd ducks I told you where they're branches to... Um, and then out of that, there's 70 non-Antarctic ones that are, uh, you know, out there for museums and, and collectors that, uh, that aren't tied to the uh, Antarctic material. And of that, there's a whopping one fall. And that's, <laughs> is that Lod Lodron? That's Lodron. <laughs> well, that's Might awesome. A little quick math, and uh, yeah. there's about 30 kilograms of this stuff on the planet. That's classified. Jeez. So uh, one person could carry it off. <laughs> Man, that's absolutely crazy. Mike, once again, thank you so much for, for educating us and, and dropping that knowledge bowlight on us. Um, really appreciate your partnership week after week. Yeah, no worries. I enjoy it. Thank you. This is uh, a, we, we looked at a few, I hope I'm not putting my foot in my mouth here, but I believe this is a very much weathered Aquapo, I'm sorry, Lodronite compared to what we were looking at earlier. Um, maybe I can be corrected if I'm wrong, but this is the ex that was the external of the stone. Now this is the internal of the stone. And this is under the classification process currently with um, Shang Yang submitted by. But I'd have to look really close to see if I see any chondrules in there to satisfy Mike. <laughs> um, uh, while we're here, I mean, might as well share this video. This is a, uh, um, a friend that was introduced to me by Maxime, uh, Maxime Denonson in Belgium. So this is Mikhail in France. I hope I got it. I got his pronunciation correct. Maybe Michael, but uh, 
I think he goes over the top in the most splendid way to create a museum experience in his collection. Please enjoy this. Hello, Topper. Hi, everybody. Mickey from France. I am glad to show you my little collection. Now you can see Pixel, who broke the trunk of this Chevy. Yeah. I like this fragment for the large fusion crust. <laughs> and next, uh, Anthony, 1919 is very special for me. It's a gift for my son. My son, Anthony, born 100 years later in 2019. <laughs> and of course, a Diablo, Canyon Diablo, sorry, 20 rams. Two other fragments of US Metroids. And on the background, you can see a, a French comics a, about Silla Koga story. And the comics on the reality. Thank you. That is awesome. Like, did you see his peak skill? You my little yeah, collection. Little no, you oh, can see. Run on uh, Hot Wheels uh, Chevy Chevelles. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go find me one. <laughs> I just thought this was the this a, a gentleman who really enjoys collecting and, and putting on a display. He's got a, a display frame with the meteorite on loop, the smashed car, just uh, tremendous, tremendous uh, display. Super happy. From France. And then he showed off a few other meteorites over here. While you're talking peak skill, by the way, those little cars, if you do get the little uh, Johnny Rocket uh, Matchbox ones, they're only two-door, uh, <laughs> not four-door like the original. All right. We are at the time now where we can show off our Logenites. Bruce, what do you have, buddy? So I have um, NWA13354. Um little four four gram tiny little slice that i got from uh, mark lyon so let's see Ooh. wow oh, that has a lot of metal in it Dude, yeah. yeah you know when i first looked at it i like it just seemed to me like this is just a high metal chondrite you know hearing the the difference but yeah so and you can see it's like really razor thin um wait give me a sec Oh, yeah, it's that's a beautiful size piece. Yeah, it, it, very nice slice. Wh yeah. Whoever prepared it. Yeah, I don't know if you know um, if if Craig did it. Like, yeah, probably. Or, was. Probably. Yeah, he does a lot of really good cutting and lapping. Yeah. Work. So. That's fantastic. I, I, I'm surprised at how much metal was on on. Maybe just that one side was polished. We could see it. Well, it does have a lot of metal. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Um, no, it's definitely has a lot, a lot of metal. The yeah, that the the first side was definitely polished, and the second side isn't polished. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it, I know I got to get a better camera for this thing. Um, just trying to, you know, get that. Yeah, uh, you know, getting the light right and. Uh, it, it's crazy because i have a piece here and it doesn't have nearly as much metal in it so thank you thank you very much bruce yeah. i appreciate that man and we'll, we'll have to check back in on one of your uh updates on lucy next week or something like that <laughs> um mike you got some show and tell of the Lodronite kind yeah yeah i got a couple to show off um so let's see these are these are smaller this is the first one hopefully you can see the the green in the corner over oh, there yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is NWA 11901, uh, and we were talking about, you know, them containing uh, chrome diopside or chromium diopside uh, as, as one of the, the pyroxenes in there. Uh, so there you can see some of that green over there in the corner, and the beauty of it is actually on the back. Oh, my gosh. Wow. So, so yeah, the backside's pretty much just one big green nugget. <laughs> is chromium diopside and chrome diopside interchangeable terms? Uh, I, I 
hear them used pretty interchangeably. I consider okay. them interchangeable terms. You know, it's just a okay. matter of, of how they're defining what the contaminant is within the diopside crystal matrix. Gotcha. Wow. That is a, that's a, you were saying earlier in your, in your presentation that the chromium diopside would be an accessory uh, component, not the majority. <laughs> No, and uh, and in this one, uh, in the write-up in the Met Bowl, it actually mentions that there is a large amount of, of chromium diopside in, hmm. in this particular um, NWA number. That's uh, NWA 11901? Correct, yes. Okay, awesome. That's the exact piece I'm going to show in a second. Yep. Yeah. And then the, the second one I had, you were talking about metal content on Bruce's. Um, this one doesn't have quite as much metal as his, but it's, it's decently high metal. You can see it all up there yeah. in the upper upper corner one of the brecciated ones and i try to do kind of a quick met bull search i'm trying to catch it in the side light so you can see the different uh class in there the absolutely chunks. yeah um and uh, i i came up with about uh, 20 of them in there popped up as containing the term breccia um mm. in the write-ups mm. um so this is uh this is nwa 5488 now, Michael, that one looks like it's got some chondrolish looking structures. Are those uh, the leftover uh, line of a chondrule? No, no, those are those are just the uh, the class. I mean, if you okay. it, they're really dark, but if you if you catch the light just right, you'll you'll see that they're they're pretty angular um, oh, for the okay. most part, uh, with a little bit of like sub rounding uh, nature to them. So yeah, this this wouldn't have any any relics in there. I'm glad you asked, Pat, because I was thinking the same thing. But when he then he catches the light a certain way, you can see that it's crystal, not not yeah. chondral, a little bit. Because the yeah. first thing that popped into my head was was uh, armored chondral. Yeah. Uh, then there's also a brown one that's hard to see that's closer to your thumb in the center there. Yeah. That. Uh, Man, that's got. That that's a weird one. I got schooled on. Uh, on uh, one of the meteorite groups about that. Yeah, and this uh, this had enough metal in it that it earned a place in with my uh, my irons because I don't want to have any problems with it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, nice. Um, and then there was one more, and it's not much to look at. It's probably better for photos. But <clears throat> you can't you can't be a type fall collector and pass up probably a once in a lifetime opportunity to score that one. And that there is it uh, is the yeah. one and only. Right, yeah. Wow. Of mm. of the 300 known grams. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. Of the 300 known grams, that is all of two milligrams. Wow. Jesus. No. <laughs> and you could see, you know, you, you had someone asking about you know, the price of rarity. <laughs> yeah. You pay for rarity, especially for that one. Holy macadamia mm. nuts. And that one and, <laughs> several boxes too, being historic, being uh, the the namesake of the class. Yeah, yeah. And this this came from Aralite from a uh, a uh, collector's um, estate that they had uh, sold off the collection for. So, out of respect for the person, they didn't release the name. But I'm hoping at, at some point that'll change, and I can work on. Uh, tying the history of this back and, and trying to uh to tie it as far back as i can because that's one of the things i enjoy doing is trying to to track the chain of custody back as far as i can so right now i just got uh arrow light to me hopefully wow. i can push that back more yeah, especially with a historic one like that you want to track it back to the grave as much as possible definitely i i enjoy a challenge of uh trying to hunt down information wow that's fantastic thank you so much mike i appreciate that sure. uh, i have uh I have the same NWA number that you showed off. Um, this is NWA uh, wet ink, NWA 11901. And this is my new 6.9 gram slice. So I'm actually gonna take it out real quick. And it does have some visible metal on it. Wow, there we go. There we and, go. And you said this this one was described as brecciated. Um, no, he said his second one was. <clears throat> oh, his second one. Okay, right. And is the this is what... chrome diopside on the right corner? Yeah, that's what caught my attention as soon as I got it. Well, first off, it's a it's an odd cut. That's the only piece that's that's sticking up, 
And I'm so glad it's not an even cut because it resulted in. But gives you a little dap. scoop at the end. Nice. Yep. And that's right where the chromium dap side is. Nice. So, yeah, I got super lucky on that one. Yeah. Um, little shout out to Ruben Garcia, I, uh, Mr. Meteorite. I appreciate the hookup on this one. And super fast delivery. I didn't even tell him, <clears throat> excuse me, didn't even tell him that we're doing a show on Loja Nights, but I think I bought it on Sunday and I had it on Tuesday. So I was super happy about that to have it to show off. I got this in the mail the other day. Um, a postcard with a meteorite on it. You can't go wrong with that. So I want to thank uh, Ken and Noreen for thinking about me on their trip to uh, Pikes Peak. That was a, a real nice surprise to get in the mail. Oh, nice. Who writes letters and postcards anymore? You know what I mean? <laughs> who, who does that? <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Ken. Hey, you're on board. Thanks, bud. Good, good to yeah, have no you. No problem. Yeah, that, that made that made my day. Honestly, I, I, I was super pumped to, to, to get that. Uh, two announcements of things to look forward to. Next week's show subject is Howardites. Yeah, and we should go for a three banger three weeks in a row. Howardites, Eucrites, Diagenites. We already did <laughs> Diagenites. Now we're going back to Howardites. We can't spell H E D in this place. But next week is all about Howardites. So if more than likely you guys have a Howardite in your collection, feel free to get ready and have it ready to show off for all of us to, uh, next week. Um, we are about three months away from the Tucson show starting. So everyone be alerted, save your money, forget Christmas, your family doesn't need gifts. <laughs> 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 but uh, we're, we're looking forward to another uh, fantastic time in Tucson. We're going to go to the Meteorite Mansion at night, hanging out, um, cutting them on the saw, lapping them, looking at them under a microscope, and just basically not sleeping. So that's the plan, and that's Tucson, and we cannot wait for it. We're going to, there's not going to be much left of Marissa when we send her back home. We're going to take her, we're just <laughs> going to, like, I know she's been looking forward to, to for Tucson for years, and we just can't wait to have her there in her element. And just, you know, I recently re heard a fact about Marissa Fanaday, uh, our our crew member extraordinaire for thin section photography. She is one. She is the only person to find a meteorite from her powered wheelchair or from her from her wheelchair. Like, I'm just blown away at the amount of dedication and just the amount of person it takes to dedicate their life that fully to go out in the Arizona desert in a wheel, a powered wheelchair and have success where others have failed. Yes. Congratulations. Oh, Marissa. Okay. Oh. Yeah. We can't wait to have you in Tucson with us. We're going to parade you around like <laughs> with such pride. <laughs> We're going to be selling tickets to the Marissa show. <laughs> So just keep your keep peel for that. There's going to be some uh, some information coming along uh, about uh, live broadcasts and different things to, to pay attention to. All right, we are checking in with our our meteorite dog in uh, in Germany, Marco Geyser. Um, Marco, I, I had to put that picture up there, buddy. What's up, um, Marco? Recently went to the Munich show, which is a huge meteorite and mineral and gem show, uh, obviously in Germany. And a lot of our friends were there. Uh, uh, I, I got lots of pictures of them hanging out together. It made me really, really miss Tucson a lot. That's why it's on my brain right now. But Marco is going to share two of his recent acquisitions from the Munich show that he just got back from. Hey guys, hello from Germany. I hope you're doing good and you have fun at the hangout. Yeah, I received some nice uh, new pieces and uh, yeah, today I want to start and show you um, one of them, maybe two. <laughs> so have fun and let's have a look on the pieces. Yeah, here we have the first piece that I want to show. This stone is an unclassified NWA chondrite and uh, it weighs 124 grams 
as you can see it shows a very nice orientation and what I really like on that piece is that extremely round or almost globular form of that stone. There you can see here the front side is a little bit weathered so not so many flow lines are visible but yeah it's all about the form and uh, I really like that. That's a very thick shield shape. Uh, we, we almost never yeah, that's get the hurt. back side of the piece. So not so many flow lines. Go ahead, Pat. I'm uh, sorry. With the, so the, this is a very thick shield and an unusual one because we, we almost never get close to spherical meteorites. And right about there, that's, a, that's about yeah. as spherical as you're going to get. Yeah. Uh, oval. Yeah, that's the back side of the piece. And you can see here, the crust is a little bit better preserved. Um, if you have a look on the crust under the microscope, you also see um, that frothy bubble <laughs> fusion crust. And yes. uh, yeah, it's a little bit better preserved on that side. It but wouldn't be a mark. As I mentioned, what I really like is the globular form of wow. this piece. Yeah, that rotation is nice. Look at that thing. Yeah. Yeah, oriented. Wow. Very thick shield. That's a nice photo of it there. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. You know how you make Marco scream, you say, cut it. <laughs> yeah, guys, and this Ooh. is the second piece um, that I want to show. The That's stone weighs 1.4 kilograms and is, of course, also a very nice oriented NWA con drive. Oh, you can see it shows a very nice conical form. So it's a clearly a oh. nose cone. It shows elongated drag clips here on that side. And Look at that deepness. on the other side, you can see wonderful flow lines, radial flow lines. It's dripping. Yeah, also here on the weathered side, there are still flow lines visible. The Beautiful. channel, too. Yeah. Okay. Elongated, like, you know, elongated regma glyph. Yeah, and also the back side of the stone is quite nice because it shows a very thick, frothy crust with really nice contraction cracks. And some beautiful shallow regmaglyphs too. Yeah. Over here you can side. see the regmaglyphs mm -hmm. pointing to the flight direction. And look here. Oh yeah. The frothy crust and the great contraction tracks. And you can see condyles through it as well. 1.4 kilos. Nice shadow. <laughs> That's a really nice piece. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> Oriented stones are getting to be, have a quite a premium on them. Back in the day, we could just dig through the tables and find them, but... Uh, hmm. Not not in the pile anymore there. No. Look no. how thick the crust is on the back side there. Yeah. Okay guys, so I hope you like the new members of my family of oriented meteorites. I have some more to show.
and in the next couple of weeks I'm going to present them to you. So for now I wish you a fantastic hangout, have fun and then see you next week. Oh. Bye bye guys from Germany. See you Marco. Bye. See you buddy. Awesome. Thank you so much man. I lo love getting love getting your videos. Nice. Yep. <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> that was all to the slideshow. So <laughs> gonna uh offer it up for you. offer it up for anyone who might have some uh show and tell. I've got one real quick show and tell there, Topher. Absolutely. You'll highlight my cell phone. Oh this this guy is a uh, uh inspired by his thick shield meteorite. Mm -hmm. This is an oriented meteorite and it's it's uh got a fair amount of weathering to it. And I think it's an 869. I, I bought it as an 869. But uh, you can see it has that, that very thick uh, shield sort of shape. And the back side of it is almost completely flat. Wow. Did not expect that. Yeah. And. Uh, Does it have any lipping? Oh, wow. Yeah. It. it uh, it, it's been handled roughly uh, and some of the pieces have spalled off, but it definitely has some uh, some lipping around the edge and thickening of the of the fusion crust there. But uh, the, the front side of it is almost uh, almost hemispherical. Well, they make a flat side so it's easier to, to, for display. <laughs> yeah, that's why it happens. <laughs> that is awesome man yeah at, i bet when that thing like the next day after it fell i bet that rollover lip was breathtaking oh i'm sure yes yeah. too bad you weren't there ten thousand years ago to collect it yeah wow that that's awesome man and th this one was bought dirt cheap it wasn't even uh i i think it was 550 dollars and <laughs> it's multiple kilograms um but back in the day you know the orientation was uh was something that you noticed but not uh not something that altered the value of the meteorite very much yeah yeah and that, that goes uh into what i was saying earlier about you know the five s's of meteorite valuation one of them was the the surface features and obviously orientation would be a surface feature and shape um I want to show you a little bit of a meteorite that I've been working on. Uh, this is my largest meteorite. Um, it was pronounced Bujia. So this is Bujia. It is from northern Kenya. It is the largest chondrite ever fallen in uh, or found in Kenya. Uh, over 300 kilos. Over 300 kilos have been found. I'll move my mic over. Wow. And this whole side is fusion crusted and regmaglyph. Wow. I was super happy when I cleaned it and saw all this fusion crust. And it goes all the way down here on this side, all the way around to this side down here, and then deep regmaglyphs in here. Yeah. There were some big, big masses of that uh, floating around out there for uh, very terrestrial prices. And when you look at it, you can actually see flow lines in the fusion crust. Yeah, the right. stippling. But I'm super happy and super proud about this one. That one right so now, Topher, how, how are you cleaning that one? Would you share some secrets with us? No, I won't. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> um, absolutely. Um, tell you what I did. Um, first off, uh, the, the, the same rule of thumb applies to all meteorites. You only want to use something softer than the meteorite you're working on. So if you're working on an iron, you're not going to use a steel brush. Um, you, you don't want to scratch it. And you, like for this, I use nylon brushes. I mean, I, I literally use toothbrushes so i made a uh a dipping container uh full of vinegar and well diluted vinegar and i just attached a, a, approached it in little patches 
and I would let the vinegar soak in a little bit, trying to loosen up some of the caliche, um, uh, let the chemical reaction do some of the work rather than my shoulder. And then I used um, toothbrushes in order to get it um, to, to clean up a little bit more. And I have a reverse osmosis system um, that gives me super, super clean water as good as distilled for meteorites. So I just washed it off with that and then put it out in the Arizona sun to dry out for one day. And that's all it took. It, uh, it could one, use some more one, cleaning. One real quick thing to over over on the topic. Um, you, you know, you want to use something softer than the meteorite, but you never, ever, ever, ever want to use a brass brush on a iron meteorite because you'll wind up with a brass meteorite, which nobody wants. Exactly. Correct. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't own any brass at all. Brass is for, you know, for, for, you know, home repair type, whatever. But when it comes to meteorites, you're going to want to stick with a nylon brush or a stainless steel brush. The stainless steel brush is good for getting a bunch of shale off the outside of a oxidized iron. Um, you can also use, um, you can also use CLR, uh, the calcium lime uh, remover. Or you can use Barkeeper's Friend, which works really, really well. Uh. Okay. Yep, I didn't know that. Yep. Every, everyone has their own, Amazon. Everyone has their own little uh, tips and, and tricks, but quite literally, it's <clears throat> be abrasive, but not too abrasive. Use as little chemical as you possibly can. Um, and uh, vinegar doesn't really change the, the constitution of the meteorite, especially when it's a display meteorite. It's not going to be classified. It's not going to be sent to a lab. No one's going to be doing any research on it. I don't have to worry about any contaminations as far as that goes. So. All right, we're checking in with our last show and tell for the day, Mr. Ben Fistler. Take it away, bud. Well, this was just one of those ones you used to find in the boxes of some of the Moroccan dealers. It's an NWA, but it's, it's also a carbonaceous oh my and gosh it's unclassified but it has a lot of character and this thing was just covered with like mud and caliche and it cleaned up real well nice little almost 50 grams see that what and what do you use for that the cleaning again was uh if it has a lot of rust on it i use Barkeeper's friend, the okay. uh, not the not the powder, but the soft scrub. Okay, awesome. Well, that that's what we're always going for. Whenever we're in uh, in Tucson digging through the bins, we're we're looking for that diamond in the rough, the carbonaceous that's that's hidden there that no one else knows about. All right, we have completed another speed run through the hangout. Oh, now I can hit. Stop recording, bring it back down to a rational pace and join the conversation with everyone else. Hey, thanks a lot, everyone. Great week. Remember, Howardites next week. See ya. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye, guys.